Welcome to week number four, lecture number one in Foundations of Christian Thought. And uh, let's move forward in looking at man. And when we talk about man, he's both image bearer and sinner. So let's start at the beginning, which the old song says is a very fine place to start. First of all, the Bible reveals that man was created in God's image. Genesis 1.27 tells us, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed to him, into his nostrils the breath of life, and therefore man became a living being, as Genesis 2, 7 tells us. And this idea of being breathed into the breath of life from God really is one of the distinctions of man and humanity from the rest of creation. It really symbolizes a special touch of God in being, uh, in Him having breathed into us um, that breath of life. But then as we move forward, we see that Genesis 3 describes the fall or how sin uh, was brought into God's creation by uh, human beings. And so we'll define sin as Horton defines sin. Um, as being God-centered, not human-centered. And so we have to realize that sin itself isn't just something we do wrong, but sin is sin because it is an affront to the holy God. And so in regards to original sin, that deals with Adam's sin of disobedience in regards to being told not to eat of the tree of knowledge and good, of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and um, the effects upon the rest of us in the human race as being as from the seed of Adam. Um, original sin can also be defined as that sin and its guilt that we all possess in God's eyes as a direct result of Adam's sin uh, in the Garden of Eden, Eden by eating of the tree. So sin is a failure to obey God's moral law, it's a failure to live in covenant with God. In other words, through our disobedience in regards to what God has set forth as that which is right. And uh, the focus of original sin is particularly on its effects on our nature and our standing in relationship with God, even before we're old enough to consciously recognize and realize uh, sin. So that's the, the failure on our part. And sin really is is an idolatry in the fact that it usurps God's authority in regards to um, our relationship with him, uh, with us saying that, and maybe not literally saying, but by our actions making it clear um, that we can live how we want to live and uh, removing him from that place of being the ultimate authority in our lives. And then it also has to do with pride. Um, in the Proverbs, pride is that sin in which is uh, really listed as, as the greatest against God um, that God detests if you, if you take that list in order and in impact that it has on us in our relationship with God. So um, Adam's sin or original sin, as we've already mentioned, um, is not only the result of our having a sin nature, but also that incurring guilt before God, which does deserve his punishment. It's something that comes as a result of us being descendants of Adam. Key note here, um, Jesus Christ um, w was not fathered by a human male, and therefore he was not technically um, in the lineage of Adam. And thus, he could be human as a result of being born uh, by a woman, uh, but not have the sin nature um, or that impact of the original sin on each one of us. And so as a result of being humans in the lineage of Adam, um, we are found guilty because he was guilty and his punishment is deserving to the rest of us who are guilty. And so as a result, it's kind of that same idea that, that the uh, when the Bible talks about the priests being descendants of Levi, even before Levi was born, they were all blessed in him 
because they were his descendants. So to um, we, as a result of Adam's guilt, uh, Adam's wrongdoing, inherit that guilt and that depraved nature, which is part of that inherited corruption that comes um, as a result. And so um, even though we're not born till uh, millennia after Adam, as a result, we are sinners. And uh, that is a guilt that, and, an, and a corruption that comes as a result of that original sin in the original man uh, that was created. In fact, Paul makes a distinction in Ephesians chapter 2 in regards to those who have come to Christ when he says, We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, we deserved that wrath of God um, as a result of the wrong that we had done. So, how do we bring solution to this? How do we um, how do we deal with this sin issue? Well, as a result of being children of wrath, uh, as enemies of God, the way the New Testament puts it, um, we realize that Jesus uh, came as God in the flesh, and as the book of Hebrews tells us that God, even though he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation um, of God. And when he had made purification of sins, verse 3 says in Hebrews chapter 1, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So we look to the person of Christ, the one who came, as Colossians 1 says, in the image or as the image of the invisible God. And so Matthew 1, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 1 reminds us of Christ coming as God and making uh, the payment for our sin or making the purification for our sin possible. Um, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come made careful search and inquiry seeking to know about this Christ and predicting the sufferings of Christ. That's what Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so we turn from being man-centered, being focused on where we've gone wrong to looking at Christ and the person of Christ as the only one who can help us. He's the one who has been announced and preached through the gospel by the Holy Spirit so that we might know. And then in Matthew chapter 1, the angel even told uh, Joseph or uh, was instructing Joseph that this son that Mary was going to have, you shall name him Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. So we we look to the person of Christ, uh, not only as our remedy, but as our redemption and as the one who would make us new in him. And we must understand that to look to Christ as being that substitution for us, that he was fully man. And that can be witnessed according to scripture and both the historical understanding of who he was. For as we see here, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. So he was born of a woman, which makes him fully human. Um, but a biological impossibility of Mary, as she professed to the angel, I've never known a man, and she used that in the strictest sense of uh, physical relations. Um, but Jesus also experienced human limitations. Um, there are scriptures that tell us he was hungry, that he was tired. And um, Jesus also experienced human emotions. He grieved. He even wept um, at the death of one of his friends. Um, Jesus himself experienced physical death. Not only was he beaten, but he was crucified on the cross. Um, and yet Jesus physically resurrected, appearing to his disciples on multiple occasions. And as Corinthians says, even to more than 500 people. Um, but at one of his visits to his disciples, he invited Thomas to touch, to physically touch uh, the wounds in his hands. So Jesus Christ um, was fully human by the witness uh, of Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me, but he was also God. He was also uh, without sin. And as I mentioned before, he was born without a sin nature because he was not 
a seed descendant of Adam, uh, but it was the Holy Spirit, as the angel explained to Mary, that would come upon her and allow her to conceive and to give birth to this son. And so God was, uh, excuse me, Jesus was fully God and fully human. It's an important that we understand that. Um, in fact, it's been a part of the discussion throughout church history um, in regards to why is it important to affirm the humanity of Jesus? Because Jesus is our representative in his obedience as the second Adam. When uh, the Bible talks about uh, the first Adam and the second Adam in Romans chapter 5, we inherited our guilt and our sin nature from the first Adam through his disobedience as the um, representative of all of humanity. Jesus Christ came as the second Adam, being fully human as so that he could be a representative of ours. Um, and that's how he qualified to be our substitutionary sacrifice, our mediator, and our great high priest, as the book of Hebrews uh, tells us. And it really is an important uh, stipulation there because as Hebrews 4.15 tells us that as our great high priest, he was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And so uh, the transgression of the one, Romans 5.17 makes clear, um, is what Adam brought in. And as a result of that transgression, death uh, came to humanity. Uh, but those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, which is uh, Jesus Christ being referred to there. So the importance in affirming the humanity of Jesus Christ is an understanding that he did come as a human being so that he might die as a representative sacrifice uh, for us. But the other aspect is that Jesus Christ is also fully God. Jesus isn't a mix. He's not half man, half God. Jesus is a unique human being in that he was fully human and fully God. And again, you can see scriptural references that, um, that note his uh, deity as it's attributed to him. And uh, those come with aspects of worship. In the New Testament, Jesus was worshipped as God was to be worshipped. Um, Jesus uh, was uh, the focus of prayer and praise as God would be understood to be the focus of prayer and praise. And as Hebrews 1.3 says, he is the exact representation of God. He is the one who has come to, as Colossians 1.15 says, um, he is the image of the invisible God. Some of the titles uh, that are attributed to Jesus in Scripture, um, the one that would have been most obvious to the religious leaders of his day is the I am, the I am statements that he made. Um, he's called the Son of God, the Son of Man, Christ, uh, the Covenant Lord. And so Christ is not only fully human, but he is also fully God. Um, Jesus recognized his divine identity. Uh, in John chapter 5, not only is Jesus the recipient of praise and prayer, um, but Jesus makes himself equal with God in, in saying that uh, he and the Father are doing the same work. He's only doing what the Father tells him to do and that he's to receive the honor um, that God is due, being the object of worship. So Jesus even set himself up as God. And, and there was no doubt that this was understood by the religious leaders of that day because in John chapter 5 it says they wanted to kill him because he was making himself equal to God. So even... As Christ was making it clear that he was fully God, those who were even against Christ recognized that that's the statement and that's the implication of what he was saying and what he was doing, um, that he was making himself equal to God the Father. And so in these divine attributes attributed to Christ, we see the eternal aspect, the omnipresence, omnip omnipotence, the omniscience, we see the immutability. Uh, we see the other characteristics of God um, that are found only in God alone. So again, just furthering the case uh, made for Christ being not only fully human, but Christ being fully God. Um, and his divine works also are attributed to 
Jesus as they are attributed to God. He's the forgiver of sins. He's the healer. He's the author of life. He's our creator. He's the one who gives salvation. He's the one who would send the Holy Spirit. He's the one, if you look back at the John chapter 5 passage, to whom uh, God had given uh, the authority to judge and to raise the dead and to make himself known to those whom he would. And so in regards to the person of Christ, we see more than enough evidence from Scripture that he was fully God and understanding that even outside of Scripture, historically, the physical and human aspect of Christ could not be denied. So both from history and from Scripture, we put together this idea of Jesus Christ uh, being fully human and fully God. I cannot emphasize that enough in regards to who he is, uh, because that's what qualified him to do um, what he can do. Um, other places where the deity of Jesus is assumed um, are, uh, as it's put here, um, he taught from, a, from what some would consider a very egocentric um, standpoint, especially um, in Matthew chapter 5, where he made the comparison of the law taught you this, but I am telling you this, putting himself equal with the very law of God, making himself that that centerpiece and that foundation for the way they should live their lives morally and ethically. Um, Jesus never apologized for statements about himself or for worship or praise that was given to him that some would see as only belonging to God. And so the deity of Jesus is always present in salutations and benedictions as you read through the epistles and the fact that Jesus is put on the same plane as God. Again, cannot over overemphasize the importance of the person of Christ being fully God. So why was it necessary that our Savior be fully God? Well, only an infinite God can bear the full weight and punishment of our sin. Um, because God is outside of us, and we all as human beings from the lineage of Adam cannot save ourselves we need someone who can come to save us and that's who god in the flesh that's what god in the flesh did through jesus christ the fact that only god can save us um, from our sins um, and only one who is fully god and fully man can be the mediator between god and man which is that gap that jesus christ bridged and then only god could reveal himself to us we could never uh, find him in and of and on our own. Um, he had to come to us. He had to reveal himself to us. Um, again, even from the very uh, birth or the announcement of Christ's birth that would come, uh, the angels said he was Emmanuel, or the scripture tells us he was Emmanuel, which means God with us. God had come to us. God had come to reveal himself to us. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, um, that Jesus came to explain God to us. So he came as God, as human being as well, fully human and fully God, uh, to reveal God to us. And um, that brings us to a, to a statement. It's called the hypostatic union. And it's a term that's used to describe how God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a human nature and yet remained fully God at the same time, this is a word that goes all the way back to the, the fourth century to recognize this unique aspect of both um, the essence as well as the characteristic without loss of either one. So Jesus Christ sits in a unique place as both fully God and fully man. And if you remember, it was back in the fourth century um, that the debate or that the um, heresy that did not place God as, uh, excuse me, Jesus as fully God. Um, the Arianism that, that is talked about in Horton's book um, is what brought about that first council that not only denounced the fact that Jesus was subordinate to God, uh, but made it clear from that original creed that Jesus Christ is God. So this hypostatic union, this, this term that comes about, is one that, that sets apart Christ in both the essence of God as well as the characteristic that he alone had 
as the second person of the Trinity. So Jesus is fully man because he has a human nature. Jesus is fully God because he has a divine nature. But Jesus is one person. And, it's, and it must be noted that he is not only one person, but that he is one person in two natures. And so I want to encourage you to keep up with your reading, especially as these concepts are laid out in Horton's book. And uh, you will see these ideas um, on your exam as well. The trust that you'll continue to keep up with your reading and continue to work on your own personal creed in a way that you'll be able to verbalize for yourself um, how you believe, what you believe in regards to Jesus Christ. So I trust God's blessing upon you and uh, look forward to uh, being with you again.